Welcome to another class. I'm Rod Bryant with Natif and the Yeshiva Perkei Shoshanim. Endeavor to educate the nations on the laws of Noah and uh, to also educate the Jewish world of the growing uh, number of pious Gentiles in the nations that are taken upon the mitzvot that are applicable to the non-Jew given by Noah and sent to Moses uh, by Hashem or codified by Moses on Mount Sinai. We're going to be starting with festivals. This is going to be the eighth part of this discussion. Now we're going to be talking about the month of Adar and Nisan. The next month in the calendar is Adar. And if you haven't already done it, please pull out your calendar. It's important to try to follow along to know when Adar falls under the calendar that we follow outside of the land of Israel. The only major holiday in Adar is Purim. Uh, which is a rabbinic celebration commemorating the victory of the Jews uh, over the Persian oppressors. Like Hanukkah, this day uh, is of little significance to Noahides. However, there are other days, though not as well known as Purim, that are nevertheless very significant. In this lesson, we'll also look at the month of Nisan and the holiday of Passover. Let's first look at this important date, the 7th of Adar. The 7th of Adar is the anniversary of both Moses' birth and death. Though there are really no special commemorations for this day, there are a number of customs that have grown up around it. However, most of these customs are not universally observed. In the past, there were some who had the custom to fast on the 7th of Adar and to recite special prayers. However, this is rather uncommon in our days. There are some who light a memorial candle in memory of Moses. In many communities, uh, Jewish burial societies hold their annual meetings on the 7th of Adar. For Noahides, Moses is a significant figure in the transmission of the Noahide laws, and it is certainly important to acknowledge his role. The 7th of Adar is, a, is an appropriate day, really, to do so. as a general rule, I would say that fasting is discouraged unless one is particularly compelled for really compelling reasons to do. Nevertheless, one may still recite prayer on the 7th of Adar. This will also be provided in the group in the near future. Uh, lighting candles, uh, the 24-hour memorial candle is, uh, is an appropriate custom for you to do. It's a great way to train your children in the home to teach them the significance of Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu and the importance of uh, his actions bringing about the Torah for the Jewish people and also the laws presented to the non-Jew. In a Hebrew leap year, when there's an extra month of Adar, the seventh of Adar is commemorated on the second Adar. If you remember that, in, in, in a leap year, if there's two Adars, it will be during the second Adar, the seventh of the second Adar. Let's examine the month of Nisan. The month of Nisan is second only to Tishri in religious significance. As with all of the major festivals of Torah, it has levels of significant uh, meaning relevant only to Israel and broader meaning relevant to the world. Let's take a look again at our sources, which are found in the Mishnah. There are four Rosh Hashanahs, that is New Year's, the first of Nisan, the New Year of Kings and Festivals, the 15th of Elul, the years of the tithing of animals, and the first of Tishri for counting years of Jubilee and Shemitah cycles, and the tithing of trees and produce. And the, the first of Shabbat is the new year for trees according to the school of Shemai, and also for the school of Hallel, he states it's the 15th of Shabbat. At four junctures, the world is judged on Passover for grain, on Shavuot for fruits, on Rosh Hashanah, all pass before him like sheep of the flock. That is both Jew and non-Jew. As, as it is written, he formed their hearts as one. He understands all of their deeds, Psalm 33. On coat, the world is judged for water. For Jews, the month of Nisan is all about Passover and liberation of Israel from Egyptian slavery. However, has a twofold meaning. It is very universal for both the Jew and the non-Jew in that sense. The first of Nisan is the Rosh Hashanah for kings and festivals. 
The 15th of Nisan is Passover. The world is judged upon the abundance of grain. Nisan, as the Rosh Hashanah for kings and festivals. Before Israel exited Egypt, the months of the Hebrew calendar were all counted from various starting points. Either the months were counted from creation, from the cessation of the flood, or the birth of Abraham after the Exodus. However, God commanded Israel to count all of the months beginning from Nisan. It states, And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be to you the beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. Exodus 12, 1 through 2. If you want to know where the Hebrew calendar really began, it's this verse in Egypt. Having established Nisan as the first month, Pesach, or Passover, is thus reckoned as the first of the festivals. This is important for calculating the window one has to fulfill the vows pertaining to offerings. This aspect of Nisan may be relevant to non-Jews, and we'll be discussing in a later lesson in detail. The New Year for Kings states in the Talmud clarifies that Nisan is only considered the New Year for the reign of Jewish kings. This is because the unique status of Nisan for Jews as the month of redemption. For Gentile kings, their reign is counted from the time of creation, and that is the month of Teshri. Has it gotten confusing enough? Keep following. We see that the status of Teshri as a Rosh Hashanah for kings is only relevant to Jews. Yet, as a Rosh Hashanah for festivals, it may be relevant to Noahides. Let's look at this. There is a judgment for grain. And the 15th of Nisan is Passover for the Jews. But for the rest of the world, it is a judgment for grain. It is on this day, actually, that God determines which nations will prosper and which will have famine. It is important to pray for the sustenance of the world at this time. Passover, one of the most precious things that pious people of the nations can do is pray for there not to be famine in the world and that people could have plenty of food to eat. On Passover, we also recite prayers, and the reason for this prayer is that the rains that fall on after the 15th of Nisan are damaging uh, of the grain harvest. It's like we want the right amount of moisture. Excess moisture uh, at this time can cause the, the, the grain to rot. Therefore, we ask for moisture instead of torrential downpours. That is, unless you live in Hawaii or in the southern part of the United States. Therefore, on the 15th of Nisan, we pray for dew, asking God for a significant amount of moisture to sustain the crops and the world without harming the drying grain. This prayer is recited on the first day of Passover during the morning prayers. Communal meals should be eaten at this time. It is an appropriate thing to eat bread and food from grains at this meal. For Noahides, the 15th of Nisan is a one-day holiday, Birkas Halanos. Blessing of the trees. Now, here's a little information to help you understand what to do. The sun is strongly associated with spring and renewal and the emergence of the world from the winter slumber. During this month, upon seeing fruit trees blossom, we make a special blessing upon them. This blessing may be made only once a year. Some have the custom uh, to gather in groups, uh, making the occasion for one celebration. And this blessing is subject to the following rules. And I would maybe take this, cut and paste it somewhere that you can have it for future reference. The blessing is said only upon the fruit bearing trees. It is a dispute as to whether or not this blessing may be said in any month other than Nisan. Next, the blessing is only recited when one sees at least two fruit bearing trees together. These trees should be over three years old, of course. According to some, this blessing should not be uh, made on the seventh day or on a holiday, that is on Shabbat or a holiday. If one has already seen blossoming trees, then the blessing is not recited. The blessing is not also recited upon the tree that is actually laden with fruit, only upon trees that is blossoming, or the first fruit of the trees are coming on. This is the blessing on the blossoming fruit trees. Are you ready? Blessed are you. Lord, our God, King of the universe, in whose universe nothing is lacking, in which he created good creatures and good trees, in which mankind takes joy. The Birchas Hachama, 
And the blessing on the cycle of the sun this is an interesting one. The blessing on the cycle of the sun is a blessing recited once every 28 years. Now, due to its infrequency, this blessing has become a special occasion for rejoicing. The Talmud writes this, One who sees the sun at the beginning of its cycle recites, Blessed is the one who makes the creation. And when is this? Abai said every 28 years. Conventional wisdom is that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. It's only mostly true. Let me explain. The exact position of its rising and setting varies from season to season. Neither the summer solace or the sun rises and sets in the northernmost point. However, near the winter solstice, the sun rising and setting is at the southernmost point. The, the midpoint of the sun's southern journey is the, uh, the autumn equinox, while the midpoint of the northern journey is the spring equinox. The interval between the reoccurrence of these phases of the solar year, which is approximately 52 weeks and one-fourth day. Now, due to the additional one and one-fourth day, these solar benchmarks shift forward slightly each year. For example, if the spring equinox is at 12 p.m. on a Sunday, then it will fall on a Monday at 6 p.m. in the following year. And the next year it would fall in the midnight on uh, Tuesday and so on and so on. After 28 years, will the sun have returned uh, back to its original position at the same time we begin our count? Well, the sun was placed in the heavens during the first hours on the evenings of the fourth day of the week. According to the sages, this was the spring equinox. Therefore, the first sunrise occurred 12 hours later on the morning of the fourth day. It is at that time every 28 years that we make a blessing on the sun. For example, in 2009 was actually the last time that blessing was made. I'm going to mark this on your calendar. The next occasion to do this blessing is 2037. How old will you be? Don't ask me how old I'll be. I hope, God willing, still around. This blessing is recited according to the following laws. The blessing is cited as soon as the entire disk of the sun has risen above the horizon. Two, the blessing may only be said until the third hour of daylight. According to some, uh, if one misses that time, then he may recite it uh, until about noontime. It is preferable that this blessing be recited by as many people together at one time. A group of people uh, would be a fantastic opportunity. And here's an interesting uh, note. Women do not recite this blessing. This is because in the times of the prophet uh, Jeremiah, the worship of the sun became widespread amongst the women of uh, the land of Israel. Therefore, women are not to recite this. It is customary for the congregation to assemble before sunrise for their prayers, timing them that they have ample time uh, afterwards to make the blessing. Following the blessing, the custom to celebrate song and music and food usually is the way to wrap it up. Here is the blessing. It states, Blessed are you, Lord our God, who makes the work of creation. It's simple but profound. What do we do about these beautiful holidays that come up, whether frequently or not? As we see that there are many of these customs that are wide open for you to study and to understand and capture the essence. And of course, the essence of these couple of holidays, to, to Bishvat, the sun, uh, the sun, the blessing of the sun, etc., it's about this. As God's creation, we have been given this great honor to master that creation, to subdue it as Adam was commanded. And in doing so, all of creation was made for mankind. Therefore, we understand that all of creation belongs to God. Everything belongs to God, to include our own bodies. That means every time that we have an opportunity to do a bracha or a blessing over the trees or a blessing of Rosh Kodesh or the new moon or blessing of the sun, we take advantage of it. It just connects us back to nature. If there's anything more important during this time of worldwide chaos and confusion is to recenter yourself to what is real. And what is real is the creation around us. Have a great day, and we'll see you in the next class.